Hello my dear students welcome to teacher at home today class we are going to learn the fifth chapter pastoralists in the modern world in this chapter you will read about nomadic pastoralists nomads are people who do not live in one place but move from one area to another to earn their living in many parts of india we can see nomadic pastoralists on the move with their herds of goats and sheep camels and cattle have you ever wondered where they are coming from and where they are headed do you know how they live and earn what their past has been pastoralists rarely enter the pages of history textbooks when you read about the economy whether in your class or history or economics you learn about agriculture and industry sometimes you read about artisans but rarely about pastoralists as if their lives do not matter as if there are figures from the past who have no place in modern society in this chapter you will see how past pastoralism has been important in societies like india and africa you will read about the way colonialism impacted their lives and how they were co-opted with the pressure of modern society the chapter will first focus on india and then africa pastoral nomads and their movements in the mountains even today the gujar bakarwals of jammu and kashmir are great herders of goat and sheep many of them migrated to the region in the 19th century in search of pastures for their animals gradually over the decades they established themselves in the era area and moved annually between their summer and winter grazing grounds in winter when the high mountains were covered with snow they lived with their herds in the low hills of the shivalik range the dry scrub forest here provided a pasture for their herds by the end of the april they began their northern march for their summer grazing grounds several households came together for the journey forming what is known as the kafila they crossed the pirpanjal passes and entered the valley of kashmir with the onset of summer the snow melted and mountain side were lush green the variety of grasses that sprouted provided rich nutritious forage for the animal herds by end september the bakawals were on the move again the time on the downward journey back to their winter base when the high mountains were covered with snow the herds were grazed in the low hills in a different area of the mountains the gadi shepherds of himachal pradesh had a similar cycle of seasonal movement they do spend their winter in the low hills of shivalik range grazing their flocks in the scrub forests by april they moved north and spent the summer in lahul and spiti when the snow melted and the high passes were clear many of them moved on a higher mountain so this is the picture that is a, a gujar cattle herders live in this man parts made of ringal hill bamboo and grass from the bugyal okay amanda was also a workplace here the gujar used to make ghee which they took down for sale in recent years they have begun to transport the milk directly to buses and trucks these mandas are about 10000 to 11000 feet buffaloes cannot climb any higher it is waiting for shearing to begin meadows by september they began their return movement on the way they stopped once again in the village of lahul and spiti ripping their harvest summer harvest and sowing their winter crop then they descended with the flock to the winter grazing ground on the shivalik hills next april once again they began their march with their goats and sheep to the summer meadows baba a dry forested area below the foot hills of the gagar and kumen by yal that is vast meadows in the high mountains further to the east in gagar and kumayon the gujar cattle herders came down to the dry forest of the bagar in the winter went up the high meadows the Bugyals in summer many of them were originally from jammu and came to the up hills of the 19th century in search of good pastures this pattern of clinical cyclical movements between summer and winter pastures was typical of many pastoral communities of the himalayas including the bhotias sherpas and kinuris all of them had to adjust to seasonal change and make effective use of available pastures in different places 
when the pasture was exhausted or unusable in one place they moved their herds and flocked to new areas the continuous movement also allowed the pastures to recover it printed that they are overuse on the plateaus plains and deserts not all pastoral is operated in the mountains they were also to be found in the plateau plains and desert of india bangas were an important pastoral community of maharashtra in the early 19th century the population in this region was estimated to be 467000 most of them were shepherds some were blanket weavers and still others were buffalo herders the langa shepherds stayed in the central plateau of maharashtra during the monsoon This was a semi-arid region with low rainfall and poor soil. It was covered with thorny scrub. Nothing but dry crops like bajra could be sown here. In the months when this tract began a vast grazing ground for the danga flocks. By October the dangas harvested their bajra and started on the move west. After a march of about a month they reached Kongan. This was a flourishing agriculture tract with high rainfall and rich soil. Here the shepherds were welcomed by Kongari peasants. After the tariff harvest was cut at this time, the fields are also fertilized and made ready for the rabi harvest. Danga flocks manured the fields and fed on the stubble. Kongari peasants also gave supplies of rice, which the shepherds took back to the plateau where grain was scarce. With the onset of the monsoon, the dangas left the Kongan. and the coastal areas with their flocks and returned to the settlements on the dry plateau the ship could not tolerate ship could not tolerate the wet monsoon conditions kharif not and crop usually harvested between september and october rabi the spring crop usually harvested after march stubble lower ends of the grain stalks left in the ground are were har- harvesting Karnataka and the Pradesh again the dry central plateau was covered with stone and grass inhabited by cattle goat and sheep herders the goat are herded cattle the kurumas and kurumbas reared sheep and goats and sold woven blankets they lived near the woods cultivated small patches of land engaged in a variety of petty traders and took care of the herds and like the mountain pastoralists it was not the cold and the snow that defined the seasonal rhythms of their movement rather it was alternation of the monsoon and dry season in the dry season they moved to the coastal tracts and left with the rains came only buffaloes like the swambi wet conditions of the coastal areas during the monsoon months other herds had to be shifted to the dry plateau at that time bangras were at another well known group of graziers They were to be found in the villages of Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra. In search of good pasture land for the cattle, they moved over long distance, selling plough cattle and other goods to villagers in exchange for grain and fodder. Accounts of many travelers tell us about the life of pastoral groups. In the desert of Rajasthan lived the Raikas. The rainfall in this region was meager and uncertain. On cultivated land, harvest fluctuated every year. Over vast stretches, no crop could be grown. So the Raikas come in cultivation with pastoralism. During the monsoon, the Raikas of Bama, Jaisalma, Jodhpur, and Bikani stayed in their home villages where pasture was available. By October, where the grazing grounds were dry and exhausted, they moved out in search of the other pasture and water. Returned again during the next monsoon. One group of Raikas, known as the Maru, that is the desert Raikas. herd camels another group reared sheep and goat so we see that the life of these pastoral groups was sustained by a careful consideration of a host of factors they had to judge how long the herds could stay in one area and know where they could find water and pasture they needed to calculate the timing of their movements and ensure that they could move through different territories they had to set up a relationship with farmers on the way so that the herds herds could graze in harvested fields and manure the soil the combined range of different activities cultivation trade and herding to make their living how did the life of pastoralists change under colonial rule that is the genealogies recounts the history of the community such oral traditions give pastoral groups their own sense of identity 
The oral traditions can tell us how a group looks its own past. Colonial rule and pastoral life. Under colonial rule, the life of pastoralists changed dramatically. The grazing grounds shrank. The movements were regulated and the revenue they had to pay increased. The agriculture stock declined and the trades and crafts adversely affected. How? First, the colonial state wanted to transform all grazing lands into cultivated farms. Land revenue was one of the main sources of its finance. By expanding cultivation, it could increase its revenue collection. It could at the same time produce more jute, cotton, wheat and other agricultural produce that they were required to inlet. To colonial officials, all uncultivated land appeared to be unproductive. It produced neither revenue nor agricultural produce. It was seen as wasteland that needed to be brought under cultivation. From the mid-19th century, wasteland rules were enacted in various parts of the country. By these rules, uncultivated lands were taken over and given to select the individuals. These individuals were granted various concessions and encouraged to settle these lands. Some of them were made headman to villages in the newly cleared areas. In most areas, the lands taken over were actually grazing tracts used regularly by pastoralists. So, expansion of cultivation inevitably meant the decline of pastoralists and a problem of pastoralists. Second, by the mid-19th century, various forest acts were also being enacted in the different provinces. Through these acts, with some forests which produced commercially valuable timber like Diodo Osar were declared reserved, no pastoralist was allowed to access to the forest. Other forests were classified as protected. In this, some customary grazing rights of pastoralists were granted, but their movements were severely restricted. The colonial officials believed that grazing destroyed the saplings and young shoots of trees that germinated on the forest floor. The herds trembled over the saplings and munched away the shoots. This prevented their new trees from growing. This forest acts changed the lives of pastoralists. They were now prevented from entering many forests that had earlier provided valuable forage for their cattle. Even in the areas they were allowed to entry, the movements were regulated. They needed a permit for entry. The timing of their entry and departure was specified. The number of days they could spend in the forest was limited. Pastoralists could no longer remain in an area. If forage was available, the grass was succulent and the underground growth in the forest was ample. They had to move because the forest department permits that had been issued to them now ruled their lives. The permit specified the periods in which they could be legally within a forest. If they overstayed, they were liable to fines. The British officials were suspicious of nomadic people. They distracted mobile craftsmen and traders who offered their goods in villages and pastoralists who chained their places of residence every season, moving in search of good pastures for their herds. The colonial government wanted to rule over a settled population. They wanted the rural people to live in villages in fixed places with fixed rights on particular fields. Such a population was easy to identify and control. Those who were settled were seen as peaceable and low-biding. Those who were nomadic were considered to be criminal. In 1871, the colonial government in India passed the Criminal Tribes Act. By this act, many communities of craftsmen, traders and pastoralists classified as criminal tribes. They were stated to be criminal by nature and birth. When this act came to be forced, the communities were expected to live only in notified village settlements. They were not allowed to move out without a permit. The village police kept a continuous watch on them. For to expand its revenue income, the colonial government looked for every possible source of taxation. So tax was imposed on land, on canal water, on salt, or trade goods, and even on animals. Pastoralists had to pay tax on every animal they grazed on the pastures. Most pastoral tracts of India grazing tax was introduced in the mid-18th century. The tax per herd of the cattle went up rapidly, and the system of collection was made increasingly efficient. The decades between the 1850s and 1880s, the collect to tax, the right to collect the tax was auctioned out to contractors. Contractors tried to extract a high tax as they could recover the money they had paid to the state and as much profit as they could within the year. By the 1880s, the government began collecting tax directly from the pastoralists. Each of them was given a pass. 
To enter a grazing tract, a cattle herder had to show the pass and pay the tax. Number of cattle heads he had and the amount of tax he paid was entered on the pass. How did the changes affect the lives of pastoralists? These measures lead to a serious shortage of pastures. When grazing lands were taken over and turned into cultivated fields, available area of pastoral land declined. Similarly, the reservation of forests meant that shepherds and cattle herders could no longer freely pasture their cattle in the forest. As pastoral lands disappeared under the plow, the existing animal stock had to feed on whatever grazing land remained. This led to continuous intensive grazing of these pastures. Usually, nomadic pastoralists graze their animals in one area and move to another area. These pastoral movements allow time for the natural restoration of vegetation growth. When restrictions were imposed on pastoral movements, grazing lands came to be continuously used and the quality of pastures declined. This in turn created a further shortage of forage for animals and the deterioration of animal stock. Underfed cattle die in large numbers during scarcities and famines. How did the pastoralists cope with these changes? Pastoralists reacted to changes a variety of ways. Some reduced the number of cattle in the herds since there was not enough pasture to feed large numbers. Others discovered new pastures when moved to old grazing grounds became difficult. After 1947, the camel and sheep herding Raikas, for instance, could no longer move into sin and graze their can camels on the banks of the Indus as they had done earlier. The new political boundaries between India and Pakistan stopped their movement, so they had to find new places to go. In recent years, they had been migrating to Haryana, where sheep can graze on agriculture fields after the harvest are cut. It is the time that the fields need manure that the animals provide. Over the years, some richer pastoralists began buying land and settling down, giving up their nomadic life. Some began settling peasants, cultivating land, others took to move. Extensive trading, many poor pastoralists, on the other hand, borrowed money from the moneylenders to survive. At times, they lost their cattle and sheep and became laborers working on fields or in small towns. At pastoralists not only continue to survive in many regions, their numbers have expanded over recent decades. When pastorlands in one place was close to them, they changed the direction of the movement, reduced the size of the herd, combined pastoral activity with other forms of income, adapted to the changes in the modern world. Many colleges believe that in dry regions, that in the mountains, pastoralism is still ecologically the most viable form of life. Such changes were not experienced only by pastoral communities in India. Many other parts of the world, new low settlement patterns forced pastoral communities to alter their lives. How do pastoral community elsewhere cope with the changes in the modern world? Pastoralism in Africa Let us move to Africa where over the half the world's pastoral population lives. Even today, over 20 million Africans depend on some form of pastoral activity for their livelihood. They include communities like Biardins, Burgers, Maasai, Somali, Boran, and Turkana. Most of them live in the semi arid grasslands or arid deserts where rainfed agriculture is difficult. They raise cattle, camels, goats, sheep, and donkeys, and they sell milk, meat, animal skin, and wool. Some also earn through trade and transport, others combine pastoral activity with agriculture, still, others do a variety of odd jobs to supplement their meager, uncertain earnings from pastoralism. Like pastoralists in India, they live in Africa pastoralists that have changed dramatically over the colonial and post-colonial periods. What have these changes been? We'll discuss some of the changes by looking at one pastoral community, the Makai, the Maasai in some detail. The Maasai cattle lenders live primarily in East Africa, 3 lakh in southern Kenya and other southern Kenya and other 1 lakh 50,000 in Tanzania. We'll see how the new laws and regulations took away their land and restricted the movement, affected their lives in times of drought and even reshaped their social relationship. Where have the grazing lands gone? One of the problems the Maasai have faced in the continuous loss of the grazing lands before colonial times, Maasai lands stretched over a vast area from North Kenya to the steepest of northern Tanzania. In the late 19th century, the European imperial powers scrambled for territorial possessions in Africa 
slicing up the region into different colonies. 1885, Maasai land was cut into half with an international boundary between British Kenya and German Tanganyika. Subsequently, the best grazing lands were gradually taken over for a white settlement and Maasai were pushed into a small area in South Kenya and North Tanzania. The Maasai lost about 60% of their pre-colonial lands. They were confirmed to an arid zone with uncertain rainfall and poor pastures. From the late 19th century, the British colonial government in East Africa also encouraged local peasant communities to expand cultivation. As cultivation expanded, pastoral lands were turned into cultivated lands. In pre-colonial time, the Maasai pastoralists had dominated the agricultural neighbors both economically and politically, by the end of colonial rule, the situation had reversed. Large areas of grazing land were also turned into game reserves like Masai Mara and Samburu National Park in Kenya and Serengeti Park in Tanzania. Pastoralists were not allowed to enter the reserves. They could neither hunt animals nor graze their herds in these areas. Very often, the reserves were in the areas they have traditionally been regular grazing grounds for Makai herds. The Serengeti National Park, for instance, was created over 14,760 km of Makai grazing land. Pastoral communities elsewhere in Africa faced similar problems. The Nambia in southwest Africa, the Koko land herders traditionally moved between Koko land and nearby Ovamba land, and they sold skin, meat, and other trade products in neighboring markets. All this was stopped with the new system of territorial boundaries that restricted movements between regions. Amadi cattle herders of Koko land in Nambia complained, we have difficulty, we cry. We are in prison, we do not know why we are locked up. We are in jail, we have no place to live. We cannot get meat from the south. Our sleeping skins cannot be sent out. Ombo land is closed for us. We lived in Ombo land for a long time. We want to take our cattle there also for sheep and goats. The borders were closed. The borders press us heavily. We cannot leave. In most places in colonial Africa, the police were given instructions to keep a watch on the movements of pastoralists, prevent them from entering white areas. The following is one such instruction given by the magistrate to the police in southwest Africa, restricting the movements of the pastoralists of Kauka land in Nambia. Passes to enter the territory should not be given the natives unless exceptional circumstances necessitate their entering. The object of the above proclamation is to restrict the number of natives entering the territory and to keep a check on them, and ordinary visiting passes should therefore be issued to them. Kakua land permits to enter magistrate of police stations, commanders of Orga and Kamanj, 24th November 1937. The loss of the finest grazing lands was and water resources created pressure on a small area of land that the Makai were confirmed within. Continuous grazing within a small area inevitably meant a deterioration of the quality of pastures, for it was always in short supply. Feeding the cattle became a persistent problem. The borders were closed. In the 19th century, African pastoralists could move over vast areas in search of pastures. When the pastures were exhorted in one place, they moved to a different area to graze their cattle. From the late 19th century, the colonial government began imposing various restrictions on their mobility. Like the Makai, Masai, other pastoral groups were also forced to live within the confines of a special reserve. Boundaries of the reserves became the limits within which they could now move. They were not allowed to move out with their stock without special permits, and it was difficult to get permits without trouble and harassment. They found guilty for disobeying the rules were severely punished. Pastoralists were also not allowed to enter the markets in white areas. Many regions they were prohibited from participating in any form of trade. White settlers and European colonies saw pastoralists as dangerous and savage, people with whom all contact had to be mi minimized. Cutting of all links was, however, never really possible because white colonies had to depend on black labor to bore mines and build roads and towns. The new territorial boundaries and restrictions imposed on them suddenly changed the lives of pastoralists. This adversely affected both the pastoral and trading activities. Earlier pastoralists not looked after animals herds but traded in various products. The restrictions under colonial rule did not entirely stop their trading activities, but they were now subject to various restrictions. When pastors drive, 
Drought affects the life of pastures everywhere. When rain fails and pastures are dry, cattle are likely to starve unless they can be moved to areas where forage is available. That is why traditionally pastures are nomadic. They move from place to place. This nomadism allows them to survive bad times and avoid crises. But from the colonial period, the Maasai were bound down to fixed area, confirmed with the reserve, and prohibited from moving in search of pastures. They were cut off from the best grazing fields, lands, and forced to live within a semi-arid tract prone to frequent droughts. Since they could not shift their cattle to places where pastures were available, large numbers of Maasai cattle died of starvation and disease in this year of drought. An inquiry of 1930 showed that the Makai in Kenya possessed 7,20,000 cattle, 8,20,000 sheep, 1,71,000 donkeys in just two years of severe drought. 1933-34, over half of the cattle in the Mackay Reserve died. As the area of grazing land shrank, the adverse effect of the droughts increased in intensity. The frequent bad years led to a steady decline of the animal stock of the pa pastoralist. Not all were equally affected. In Maasai land, as elsewhere in Africa, not all pastoralists were equally affected by the change in the colonial period. In pre-colonial times, Maasai society was divided into two social categories, elders and warriors. The elders formed the ruling group and met in periodic councils to decide on the affairs of the community and settle disputes. The warriors consisted of younger people mainly responsible for the protections of the tribe. They defended the community and organized cattle raids. Raiding was important in a society where cattle was well. It is through rights that the power of different pastoral groups were, was asserted. Young men came to be recognized as members of the warrior class where they proved their manliness by raiding the cattle of other pastoral groups and participating in wars. Now, however, were subject to the authority of the elders. To administer the affair of the Maasai, the British introduced a series of measures that had important implications. Appointed chiefs of different subgroups of Maasai who were made responsible for the affairs of the tribe. The British imposed various restrictions on raiding and warfare. Consequently, the traditional authority of both elders and warriors was adversely affected. The chiefs appointed by the colonial government often accumulated wealth over time. They had a regular income with which they could buy animals, goods and land. They lent money to poor neighbors who needed cash to pay taxes. Many of them began living in towns and became involved in trade. The wives and children stayed back in the village to look after the animals. The chiefs managed to survive the devastations of war and drought. They had both pastoral and non-pastoral income and could buy animals when the stock was depleted. But the life history of the poor pastoralists who defended, depended only on the livestock was different. Most often, they did not have the resources to tide over bad times. In times of war and famine, they lost nearly everything. They had to go looking for work in the towns. Some elk out of a living as charcoal burners, others did odd jobs. The lucky could get more regular work in road or building construction. The social changes in mosaic society occurred at two levels. First, the tradition difference based on age between the elders and warriors was distur disturbed through it did not break down entirely. Second, a new distinctions between the wealthy and poor pastoralists developed. Conclusion So we see the pastoral communities in different parts of the world are affected in a variety of different ways by changes in the modern world. New laws and new borders affect the patterns of their movement. With increasing restrictions on their mobility, pastoralists find it difficult to move in search of pastures. As pasture lands disappear, grazing becomes a problem, while pastures that remain deteriorate through continuous overgrazing. Times of drought become times of crisis when cattle die in large numbers. Yet pastoralists do adapt to new times. They change the path of their annual movement, reduce their cattle numbers, press for rights to enter new areas exert political pressure on the government for relief, subsidy and other forms of support and demand a right in the management of forests and water resources. Pastoralists are not released of the past. They are not people who have no place in the modern world. 
environmentalists and economics have increasingly come to recognize that pastoral nomadism is a form of life that is perfectly suited to many hilly and dry regions of the world activities okay so that's all about this chapter if you are interested please do like share and subscribe my channel okay thank you